I thought about audiences came out of the fact, the fact <laughs> that um, on Spotify, uh, one of your tracks, uh, Subtext, has, 36, has had 36 million plays. Mm. Number two is <coughs> Underpass. <laughs> Uh, With a which, lot less plays, I think. I mean, the two together mm. are your two, mm. your two worlds, aren't they? Yes, two yeah, exactly. Worlds. Yes, yeah. How can you explain, can you explain either of them? Explain, well, explain <laughs> music. <laughs> I, you know, I've, 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 well, I've often asked people what a good melody is, and I've never heard a good explanation. Can anybody explain a good melody? What a melody is? These very basic things that we all take for everyone knows a good melody when they hear it. But to say, what is it? You know, what the hell is it? It's, um, it's very difficult. We can't do it. And many things, I think there should be a radio program say about what is it? You know, what's the queen? And the, as the John Cooper Clark says, what's occasional furniture? The problem for me is I could explain to you, I hope, what an interesting melody is. The problem is the word good. Yeah. Well, good, yes, the word good. Well, go on, explain what an interesting melody is. <laughs> <laughs> no, I need, we'll my, the tools, I need the tools of my trade here. I need a keyboard. <laughs> I need... I need uh, you need to give examples. Records. Yeah. I need Spotify. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's very interesting trying to put things into words, isn't it? But the, the two sides of it are... I, I, I like ferocious assault in music. I really enjoy that. And uh, loud music that has a physical presence. You know, we can almost... I almost see it as objects. You know, I, I, do, I do see sounds as objects. You know, I see a bass drum as a thing like a cannonball, you know, and the uh, synthesizer delicate one would be the, the horizon. The whole thing becomes a sort of landscape that you place objects in, and that's how I, I mix it. You know, when I'm mixing. Um, and the other thing, the, the the very quiet, tranquil music comes out of Sati, um, who was another surrealist. You know, Sati was a surrealist, and um, Sati. Uh, again, I met Sati at art school when a, a friend of mine played. Gymnopodies, and that was the first time I'd heard it on the lecture theatre piano. And I, I, I was struck dumb. I, 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 I couldn't move when that music was playing. It was so beautiful. And I said, what, what is that? You know, and I, I went and bought the record, which had a Picasso drawing then of, yes, of Eric Sarti on the front of it. Alfredo Ciccolini. Exactly, yes, yeah. yes. Beautiful cover. And it's a, it's a lovely... Um, a beautiful piece of music, and it, it, it stayed with me forever. I st it's still my ideal. And it was when I met up with Harold Budd, who I played subtext with, that there are two of us involved in that record. It was, Eric Sarti was his hero as well, or one of his heroes, very significant. And um, Harold was the first modern musician I'd met that had brought Sarti into the modern world via jazz. He started off as a jazz player and then abandoned jazz because it was cliched and he, he, he detests cliché. So he started again and made this kind of music that is tranquil, empty, minimal and so on. And I, when I heard his music I, I knew what he was doing. I could hear his intentions and I got in touch with him right away. And we started to work together. Um, Underpass was a piece of punk electro that I knocked together in an eight-track studio in, in London that cost 100 quid a day, which was quite a lot of money at that point, but not, not, not unaffordable. And I did it in three days. And it has six tracks of sound on it. On a, we only used six tracks out of the eight-track mm -hmm. recorder that we had. So that was as minimal as I could get used a drum machine, which was forbidden territory in those days, wasn't it? I can remember the engineer when I first brought that in. Oh, you mean getting the union involved? Yes. In it, yes. <laughs> yeah. Groaning, you know, oh, God, what's this? You know, despise, they despised anything. And I was trying to introduce this because it was much more convenient than a drummer. 
<laughs> it was this big, you know. The drum kits were so massive, and he had to sit there for half a day hearing the drummer go boom, boom, boom. How's that? Boom, boom. <laughs> Horrible experience. So, and, and they don't drink the yes, drum machines. And they, do, yeah. they don't swear or drink or assault you when they're, <laughs> when they're drunk. You know. <laughs> um, well, you raise a, an interesting point there, which is that you worked in that period between analogue and digital. Yes, uh, definitely. Yeah. Could you tell us something about that for people who aren't familiar with the equipment of that period? Yeah, it was, it was uh, again, an interesting technological transition. And I used to do talks when I taught about technology and art because I think the two are entwined completely, just like surrealism and art. Um, and I think technology is, is our way of negotiating a magical universe as well as we can. Um, and I was in the semi-magical universe of analog um, synthesizers. I think it's interesting because if you, if you think what we were working with tape. Now tape is really interesting because it's bits of pummeled rock attached to a bit of flattened forest. <laughs> and it records sound. What's more magical or surreal than that? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? It's pummeled rock attached to flattened forest, ancient forest, plastic, iron oxide. And you can record music onto it. How balmy is that? That's tape. Fantastic stuff. You can cut it up, reassemble it. It's wonderful stuff. All these things are magical. They're strange. How the hell did we get to that? How the hell did we ever understand that iron oxide attached to flattened forests can record sound, make music? All the music you heard on the radio till about 1975 was made on flattened forest. But after that, something else came in that's even more magical and strange. Digits, ones and zeros. And I'm still trying to come to terms with it. We got to the end of analog. We began to understand what you could do with tape. It had great properties. It compressed sound in a certain way. So if you recorded really loud onto it, it would sound really loud when it came back because it sounded bigger than its environment. It was distorted. And that distortion is a magical thing. It means that it makes you feel that the instrument's bigger than its environment. It's trying to break out. It's got more energy than can be contained. That's a fantastic thing. And it's really exciting to listen to. That's why punks like me jumped up and down when we heard it. Because it, it was like us. We were trying to get out of our environment. We were trying to be bigger than our environment. We were trying to break out, find another part of the universe that we could occupy. And that's what that kind of music did. And when digits came, it was far too calm and nice and controlled and it had no madness in it it was completely sort of calm it was like apple it looked like an apple computer you know it was beautifully designed and smooth and didn't have any rough edges and we still don't really know what digital sounds like it's a it's an empty medium it hasn't been filled properly yet by outlaws who can exploit its weaknesses as we did with analog. We, with analog, our duty as musicians was to try to get as close to destroying the damn thing as you could, <laughs> but still have it convey what you'd done. In digital, that's almost impossible because it's mathematical. It's, it, it's a mathematical environment that you're sticking this organic stuff into and it doesn't quite match yet. Um, I've still got the ear of the sound of digital. I don't really know what it is yet. We, we got, it, it's like all these mediums, like um, building, for instance, you get to a point where it reaches perfection, a Georgian house, and then the technology changes. You have Victorian industry coming in, so you suddenly had iron and uh, pressed glass and all kinds of things that you didn't have before, so you could make different structures. So... 
architecture became very different after that technology hit. Same with film, you know, as soon as color film came in, all that beautiful composition in black and white that you had, Alfred Hitchcock and so on, was destroyed in, fl in favor of bright color. Everything was brightly colored. And it took a long time to get back to, to composition and, and composing. You know. And we're still in that midstream. We're still trying to make um, digital things sound like analog things. It's what I call the four mica period. It's bad thinking. Because four, you know, when four mica came out, we tried to imitate wood, didn't it? You know, remember all the bars in the pubs? You know, uh, pubs became refaced with four mica. Thought it was better somehow. We didn't realize it was a material that could have a beautiful white, clean surface, uniform, gorgeous. Instead, we made it look like glass or put shiny speckles into it or tried to make it look like wood, f fake wood. Well, Anal uh, digital is very much like that at the moment. Mm -hmm. Lots of people are trying to imitate the quality of tape through digital simulations and so on. And analog simulations, uh, analog distortions. There, there's a whole industry of imitation. Even digital film is trying to imitate analog film. So all the mediums are still imitative. And at some point, we'll get to find out what digital can do that analog can't. And we, we already know a lot of that, but that's just in capacity, really, and replay. But we haven't really discovered what it sounds like or looks like yet. But that will come, I think. So an example of uh, Ultravox um, analog is like Young Savages, that sort of thing? Yeah, Young Savage would be a good So you savage, yeah. Yes, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's <laughs> being as savage as you can. Feedback yeah. is another yeah. thing. It's an accidental thing that you get from guitar when you get near a, a speaker. And we exploited that as much as possible. I think Pete Townsend was the first in The Who to do it, but he only did it in a very mild way. And we wanted to do it in a way that could wreck speakers. So he, that was the mission, really, I think. Mm. So you, you're exploiting the medium to its limits. And I, I think we haven't got anywhere near that with digital yet. Right. And an example of analog and digital working together is something like underpass? Um, th there's no digital... It, well, there are synthesizers, ah. but there are analog synthesizers. Right, sorry. Um, I, it, I didn't start using digital things until the 1980... till 1985, I think. Ah. Um, mm. When I... I th or whenever the first DX7 came out. Uh, Yam Yamaha made Yamaha. that synthesizer. It's Eno's favorite synthesizer um, because it's so difficult, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, that, that was when I first began to use it. So all the records from about 1983, I think, had digital sounds on them. Yeah. But they were much too clean and not exciting enough, really. I didn't enjoy that period much. That's why I legged it slightly after that. And then when, of course, there was a, there's always a, a recovery period, isn't there, when any medium becomes um, replaced. You know, when we had colour film, colour photography and colour movies, there was, a few years later, there was a move back into black and white and a, a, re, a retrieval of what we'd lost. People began to recognise we'd lost certain things. So with music, I think there was a recovery period where people in Detroit began to buy old synthesizers from pawn shops and make music again with them. And they made this thing called Acid, which came out and in about 1988 was the first time I heard that. And as soon as I heard it, I was right at home. I thought, yeah, that's, that's a, a 909, 808 drum machine. There's a 303, there's a 101. It's all going together. I want, I want, to, use, I want to get back into music again because I, I understand mm. this stuff. I didn't understand the late 80s where it was all double-breasted suits and white soul. Awful stuff. Not my kind of stuff at all. Uh, I just don't fit into that. But that acid music was perfectly on the, on the ball. And surrealism came back in to music again. Mm. Everything had got too rational. Digital synthesizers had affected digital thinking. Sampling, 
everything got very straight and boring and tedious. I, I'm not going to name the bands, but you know them. 